And I want to thank the committee and the Polo Foundation for this prize, and some of this prize will actually go to support uh, the, the Fund for Ukraine. So um, I'm sort of privileged to, to be here and give a little bit of talk about my career, and I um, started to think where, where actually started to get interest in science, and I think everything started with Mickey Mouse. Um, when I was a big fan of uh, Mickey Mouse, which in Italian is called Topolino, and uh, so after reading each story, I just wanted to know the total number of pages that I, were, that I read. But there, there was a trick. I couldn't just simply take the last page of the magazine to see the total number of pages, so I had to uh, subtract the pages there where they had uh, um, advertisements, because that, that was cheating. And so I will take the total number of pages, taking out the one with advertisements, and then write the number on top of each magazine, put it in a box, and then write the total number of the, on the box of the number of pages without advertisement. And so I thought that was my first research project, uh, and uh, I thought it was very rewarding. My parents didn't think so, because they had their basement full of boxes of Mickey Mouse, and I, didn't, and I still don't want them to throw it away. So um, after this first research project, I went on unsurprisingly to study statistics, I guess that was um, something there, and uh, that gave me the opportunity to um, go and do my uh, master thesis and my PhD with Eric Ingerson at Karolinska Institute. And uh, Eric was a, is a fantastic mentor. Uh, he kept me in his group despite I misspell his name on my master thesis. And uh, um, I think uh, Eric taught me too many, too many things, to do the science that you think is fun, that you are interested in, but also to do it efficiently, so to combine creativity with pragmatism. And uh, um, I work with also Patrick Magnusson, Tove Fall, and Marcel Denol over, over the years. And uh, um, during my PhD, I was interested in understanding how different omics could predict uh, future cardiovascular events, and so we look at genomics and metabolomics. Now, I just want to point you on the date of this paper. It was nine years ago. Uh, at that time, I noticed we didn't call this polygenic score. We called them multilocus genetic score. I'm not sure why that went out of fashion. Um, but um, this was one of the first papers coming out on this topic, and uh, uh, only now we start to see the first trials where polygenic score are uh, tested for primary prevention. So it takes time, and to change anything in medicine, it takes a lot of time. Um, I've been also working on GWAS consortia, and uh, uh, for the PhD students in the audience, I highly recommend if you have the opportunity to do this type of experience. Uh, it taught me that science is not done alone in a basement, in the dark. It's actually done by collaborating with other people, exchanging information, working as a team. Um, towards the end of, of, of my PhD, um, uh, we work on, on uh, this paper where we took some of the ideas from the um, uh, you know, complex trait genetics and omics, so we wanted to take, uh, um, and we apply them to epidemiology. So we took many different uh, predictors uh, for, uh, for, and risk factor and check how they will predict mortality. And this was one of the first large scale use of UK Biobank. This was before UK Biobank actually had any genetic data. We did a website. The website was visited by four million people the first week, which means that the sizable proportion of uh, people in UK, uh, they went there to calculate their risk of dying in the next five years. I thought that was very British. <laughs> um, I then went to the um, summer school, the Lena Peltonen School of Human Genetics. That, that was a fantastic experience. So the summer school stopped during COVID time, but I was told that it will start again. There I had the opportunity to meet uh, some of the leaders in human genetics. And uh, that was there where I decided to do my postdoctoral studies at, at the uh, Broad Institute and uh, the Analytical and Translational Genetic Unit, where um, I was supervised by previous awardee uh, Ben Neal. Um, this was a, um, a, a, 
truly um, amazing experience, and I still have a lot of friends from that period. I think uh, Ben and also Mark uh, taught me that the importance of methods, but mostly about how it's important. Science is not about the result. It's also about how you share the result, and how you communicate, and how you make uh, what you do available to others. Uh, during my postdoc, I, I work on trying to understand how um, um, damaging loss of function and missense varia, which are normally being studied in the context of Mendelian disorder, will actually impact the complex trait in the general population. And so similar to common variants, we saw that uh, uh, rare and ultra-rare damaging mutation will have impact on complex traits, such as educational attainment, but also other traits in the general healthy population. And I think this work was, you know, building this bridge between the complex trait genetic community and the clinical genetic community, and also between common and rare variants, which would probably stop to call it common and rare, and just this is just a genetic variation. Um, I also work on a, a, a GWAS of uh, um, same-sex sexual behavior. This is an interesting but very sensitive topic. And so a couple of lessons that I learned, um, the first one is that, uh, well, especially with this topic, you need to work hard to communicate the result outside the scientific community. But is actually the most rewarding part is this one, is being able to reach out and be able to translate your scientific funding to the outside community. Um, and also that, you know, uh, there will always be someone that will criticize your work, no matter how, you know, perfect you try to be in your communication and your results. And, and so some have suggested, suggested maybe we shouldn't even answer this question or should try to do this uh, sort of analysis since uh, the risk of being misinterpreted. And um, I think that it's important to strike a balance that we shouldn't sort of be naive and think that what we do doesn't have an impact to society, it does. But at the same time, it's rather short-sighted to think that the best way to avoid potential downstream consequences is not answering or asking these questions. So um, I went on to start a group at the Institute of Molecular Medicine in Finland that um, we, call, uh, we call each other Data Science Genetic Epidemiology Lab. Um, and I'm really blessed to work with this bunch of people. Uh, they are, it's a very diverse group and makes me happy to go to work every day. And most of the work I'm presenting is from actually uh, their work. And so, I mean, part of this award uh, goes to my team, so thank you. And uh, um, science is, your scientific career is, is rather weird because you are, you know, doing your postdoc and uh, maybe you are in a lab or you are doing coding in uh, somewhere and then suddenly you are thrown in a management position and so you need to start to manage people. And other career path people are sort of, um, uh, you know, instruct how to do that. We are just thrown in this position. And so some of the things I've learned um, is that um, you need to find what interests people and enable to follow their interests. And also, you should try to create an environment of openness, transparency, and kindness. Um, but these, these are clearly suggestions that I think everyone agrees, but there is another important one, uh, which is like, be present. So uh, like, you know, answer your email, be there for a meeting. Uh, and uh, sometimes we, we think that people should be independent, and so we are not like, you know, replying emails anymore or things like that. But I think, you know, uh, being present and caring, it's very important. So what we have been done so far, um, we were able to, um, reposition the group since we were quite uh, um, uh, quite a new group to study COVID-19 among other things and so we started the COVID-19 OS genetic initiative which is now on the seven release um, and include uh, um, uh, more than 80 studies from 35 countries and in total more than 200,000 COVID positive cases uh, among um, 3 million genotype individuals. And sometimes I feel ashamed because I'm invited to speak about this uh, community, but honestly, I, 
Yeah, well, I, I started together with Mark, but most of the work is then that been done by other people. Here I'm reporting some of them, like Mari and Yua, which is really the analytical, have been the analytical power under this project, and many actually in the audience have uh, contributed with data. So if you're interested, please use the QR code and you can see all the contributor, which is more than 1,000. So what I'm gonna do now is just to tell you a little bit the result of this initiative. I'm gonna do an experiment, and hopefully if there is any GWA skeptical left in the audience, you will be convinced that GWAS work. So what I've done is that I've taken um, well-known path pathways of COVID-19, and these are genes and pathways that have been proposed through in orthogonal approaches, not human genetics. And what I'm gonna do is take the Manhattan plot that you see here on the bottom and trying to map the peaks on the Manhattan plot on these pathways. So let's start this sort of journey. So the SARS-CoV-2 virus enter in the upper respiratory tract and the first thing it encounters is the airway defense. Uh, one of uh, the main airway defense is the mucus um, and the mucus is um, um, the, the mm, MCU5 proteins is, a, uh, is involved in the formation of the mucus. Then the virus get closer to the ciliated cell. Here there are the two mucin genes which product is involved in uh, airway defense. And the surfactant protein D, which is part of the um, uh, innate immune system, immune response of the lungs. If the virus passes these initial defenses, it needs to attach to the cell. It does that through the ACE2 receptor and the TPRSS2 receptor, which prime the S protein. And then the product of the SLCA20 gene, which is CIT1, interacts with phase two and regulate um, uh, the viral entry. Now, the virus enter in the cell, uh, it needs to be recognized. This is done by several genes, including TLR7. And TLR7 is the main result from uh, large-scale exome uh, sequencing analysis looking at rare uh, uh, mutations. And uh, uh, interferons are produced, are recon, uh, recon, uh, recon, recognized by the interferon receptor, which activate the JAK stat pathway. They recruit these stat uh, genes uh, from the cytoplasm. They are activated, they go to the uh, nucleus, and they start transcriptor several genes, including OS1. So what, what we've done here is taking the human population, a simple phenotype, like having, not having COVID, or having COVID and being hospitalized for COVID, and we have checked their, compared their genome. And here you have a clear picture on how these peaks that are done through sort of a relatively simple experiment actually map non-biology. But the very interesting thing is that when you remove this peak, there are many other peaks there, and these are all new biology that we can learn from this type of uh, genome-wide scans. But my group is not so interested in the biology, but more in the translation of these uh, genetic findings into, uh, into the clinics. And so as part of this Intervene Consortia, which I'm co-leading with Samuel Repatti, we have started to talk how we can take polygeny score and other risk factor and start to move them closer to clinics. What you see here is the um, lifetime risk for type 2 diabetes by different centile of a polygeny score for type 2 diabetes. Each of, an, each of us is on one of these trajectory. If you are in the top 1% of the polygeny score, you have up to a 60% lifetime risk of having type 2 diabetes. If you are in the bottom 1%, you are around 5% lifetime risk. So this is, start to see how these polygeny score, they are really uh, powerful in uh, determining risk and clearly uh, potentially suggesting that preventive treatment can be targeted to some of these individuals. And Intervene is well represented at the European Society of Human Genetics. We have um, 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 poster and talks from Brooke, Bradley, Julian, and Sophie, so um, um, please go and uh, check their poster and talks. We also started to uh, sort of uh, take genetic results and giving them the language to speak with public health. 
Uh, often in genetics, we speak about odds ratio, p-values, but that's not something that you can really communicate to public health officials. And metrics that are used are, for example, disability-adjusted life years or healthy life years. These are the metrics that are used to compare diseases, to compare the impact and the importance of risk factor across countries. So, we have developed methodology to map genetic results to healthy life years, and you see, for example, that having uh, um, um, a damaging uh, clean var mutation or enigma mutation in BRC2 correspond to a, a loss of around five years of healthy life. And that's more or less what we see also of being in the top 10% uh, versus 90% of some of polygeny score, like multichronic pain or coronary artery disease. Genetics can also be used to empower epidemiology and to understand the epidemiological bias and in study design. So in this work we have done, um, um, we have compared, we have done a GWAS of males versus females, but only on the autosomes. Now from textbook we know there shouldn't be any genetic difference between males and females on the autosome, but we see a lot of peaks on this Manhattan plot. And these are actually peaks that represent the differential participation between men and women into a study. So by looking at this peak, we can understand which characteristic differentiate men and women in participate to a study. If you are interested in this idea, I recommend this paper that came out very recently from a common colleague about the genetic of participation. It's a, it's a, to me, a rather mind-blowing concept that in our genome there are information about participation to study and what differ study participants to those that have not participated without measuring any phenotype. Um, and uh, um, it, another interesting fact is that actually if we take this sort of genetic of study participation and we check it for correlation with other traits, we find very interesting things. For example, a statin adherence, uh, the highest genetic correlation among different traits with statin uh, drug adherence, is actually with participation in follow-up studies um, in, 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 the, in the UK Biobank in this case. And this is higher than things like cholesterol or coronary artery disease. If you're interested in uh, uh, this work and, and many other results on uh, the genetic and environmental determinants of drug adherence, I recommend a uh, um, uh, poster talk from Mattia. Okay, um, so I, I guess now you, you might say, well, we started doing GWAS of diseases, now we get, got all wild doing GWAS of everything. Um, uh, are, aren't we forgetting that actually most of um, these traits are environmental, are their social demographic component and social component, and genetic has really a small role in some of these things. And it's true, and uh, I think that's probably uh, what we should try to do, at least in the complex trade genetics community, is, is, is trying to bring much more of the socioeconomic, environmental, and component into our genetic analysis. And uh, you might have seen this, this review um, um, on the book of Catherine Page um, on uh, gen the genetic lottery, and if I don't agree much with the review, but the, the review really uh, highlights how much of the scientific community still think that genetics is sort of exceptional. There is this idea of genetic exceptionalism, essentialism, and determinism. And so um, I think it's important that we try with our research to go beyond and stop to give this idea uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, many, that many have. And I think there is nothing exceptional about genetic. Genetics should be combined with such economic, environmental factor, and genetics is an extremely useful tool for medicine, but not only for medicine, actually for social science and economics as well. And so, to give you a more concrete example of what we are doing to go in that direction, we have the FinGen project, which some of you are aware is one of the largest European projects uh, in terms of uh, uh, collecting genetic information. Uh, we are um, um, collecting genetic information around 10% of the Finnish population and 500,000 individuals. We have created sort of a sister project, which is called Fin Registry, which collect many health, demographic, and socioeconomic information this type for the entire uh, Finnish population using uh, a new secondary data law that was approved uh, in Finland, and more in general, uh, the richness of the Nordic registers. 
And this fin registry project, uh, project has many health information, but also uh, many social demographic information, familiar relationship, and environmental information. And it's only by combining genetics with environment and social uh, economic information that we can sort of better understand complex traits. And the way we, we approach this project is a little bit different of a traditional epidemiological approach, but we again learn from what we have learned from genome-wide association study and large hypothesis-free um, research, uh, which is that we take this data, we process them, we make aggregate data immediately publicly available and explorable. So for example, if you go on this website, you can explore all these disease endpoints, how many people are diagnosed every year with this disease endpoint, their association with uh, different uh, um, other uh, set of information. Okay, so uh, I hope that uh, um, um, my career has shown that you actually don't need to have a niche, really. Uh, you can do research across different topics, and to do that, you just need to be curious and you need to love data. And myself and people in my team, we all love data. And I have three favorite data points, uh, which are actually my family, uh, which have been supporting me. So thank you. And uh, I also want to mention that there are um, some other poster and presentation from um, people in the team, from Jivo, Oshing, Lisa, and Ankita, so please have a look. And I, I want to, to thank the fundings that, I mean, I think we live pretty much in an amazing period where you receive money to do what you like. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. So we, we have time for a few questions for Andrea. Please come to the microphone and, and state first your name. Uh, Andrea, may I ask you to repeat the question in case? Sure. Stylianos. Um, I'm here, Andrea. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I saw you, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations on your award. Thank you. <clears throat> Extremely well uh, uh, deserved. I have a question about the so-called polygenic risk scores. And um, I'm aware that some uh, institutions and companies are using them in uh, selecting embryos for pre-implantation diagnosis. And I was wondering, if, um, if you think that we're ready to use these scores for prediction of uh, uh, life risks even in, in children or in unborn children? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, it's very early stages, and uh, um, I don't think we are there yet, not because polygenic scores don't work, but more because I don't think we have, have that type of societal discussion about uh, this topic in particular. So um, I think we have shown that polygenic score for certain traits uh, predict quite well, but I think that before going ahead and implementing this type of technique, uh, we will probably need to discuss more, more as a society or if it's right or wrong. Somebody else? So, con continuing, uh, Inga, please. Andrea, congratulations. E exceptionally enjoyable talk. Uh, I, uh, I really like your points about how you came here. And now I want to ask you, what about the future? So we are in genetics, we love big data. We probably start thinking about new approaches. So do you think we are coming close to using machine learning, artificial intelligence in human genetics? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I, I mean, 
I don't know if machine learning applied directly to human genetics, it's gonna be such a breakthrough. Um, just because we know the structure of the genome and we need to, we have so many prior we can put in the structure of the genome like LD and other things which if you just throw everything in a black box you actually make, get out worse result than putting some of this knowledge in. Uh, that doesn't mean you cannot design smart system that have uh, that component. Um, but um, there, there are other, many other applications of machine learning that interact with genetic. For example, we, we have a talk where we used uh, a machine learning to predict phenotypes in people, you, you know, in the general population and then see how people having high risk but not having developed yet the disease and how we can combine this type of risk with uh, genetics. So that's, that's a sort of an application um, of, of machine learning. But I will resist on the hype that, uh, you know, machine learning is going to change genetic. I don't, I don't think so. Thank you, Andrea. Congratulations. Thank you. So I would like to call the next speaker, Dr. Sadaf Farouki. Uh, from uh, the University of Cambridge uh, uh, Welcome uh, Center, Institute of Metabolic Science, uh, who is going to talk about the genetics of weight regulation. Sadaf, please.